So for the third year running, I'm back at Walton Classic Car Show, where, in fact, the last couple of years, it's been absolutely cracking. The flags here, we've had a bit of a heat wave. A bit cooler and breezier today, but still a great turnout for this uh, really popular show. Um, now, someone I met quite early on um, on the classic car scene is Richard here. Now, um, Richard's avoided me uh, until now with his car coming on camera, but uh, I really did want to talk to him because he's got this fantastic uh, Cortina behind me. Now... This cartoon has got quite a history with you, hasn't it? It certainly has, yeah, yeah. I've been driving this car since I was 17 years old. Yeah. So um, it belonged to your father and then you learnt to drive in it, didn't you? I did, yeah. I'm a twin brother. Yeah, yeah, twin yeah, brother, yeah. 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 Um, I did more driving than he did. I used to drive to the family caravan at Bridlington on a Friday night on the back roads and then drive us all back on a Sunday afternoon. So right. I got a fair few hours under my belt before I took my test. Yeah. And I passed first and my twin who didn't drive it very often had to, had to take his test a second time. All right. <laughs> Just, uh, yeah, the, the twin brother is here, um, but he didn't want to come on camera and defend himself, so he <laughs> left you to do all the yeah, work, yeah, hasn't yeah, he? Yeah. 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 Uh, he did actually mention he um, he ended up with a, one of, of his own, a Crusader, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Um, so he, he went off to university to Scarborough and um, my dad's friend had a friend who had a Crusader saloon um, and I think we paid a couple of hundred quid for it at the time and did it up a little bit during the summer and then he took it off to university for a few years but it was never as uh, good as this one. No this it, is a really nice one it, isn't it? He had a few problems with it, it, it didn't like uh, the cold and damp weather on the coast. So this particular one's a 1.6L, is that right? It is, yeah, yeah. yeah. What's this, this shade of blue? It's a fab fabulous colour. It's, it's Titan blue, yeah. It's it's fairly, no, not rare, but you don't see a lot of them these days. Um, we do have another car, which is a Crusader Estate, that's the same colour. That was bought as a donor car for the re restoration on this one. Yeah. Which we did about nine years ago, I think we finished it. Um, and then we decided to do the other one because it was just too good to scrap. So we, yeah. we, we, we're lucky we've got two now. And obviously I do always see the uh, the matching pair at these shows, don't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the uh, Crusader Estate version that yeah. we've got. Yeah, yeah. So. so this was the donor car for the saloon restoration. And then we put this away for a couple of years and then thought, oh, we'll just tart it up and sell it on. But then we'd seen the, one, the saloon and the job that we did on that and decided to do a, a proper restoration job with this one. And we're really glad we have because it stands out and uh, you don't see them very often. Yeah, I mean, considering how popular the Cortinas were, in fact, so popular that uh, people were going mad to buy them when the Sierra came out, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, but these days, uh, you don't really see many at all, but these estates, I honestly can't remember having seen another one. There's one or two knocking around, but not, not many at all. There's probably two or three that I know of in this colour, and that's probably about it, to be right. fair. Right. Yeah, considering they sold about, I think, one, over 1.1 million yeah. Mark 5s. It's, you know, there's only a handful of left, left these days. Yeah. Not many at all. So, obviously, you've got the history with the car, family ties and things, but other than that, what is it about? Cortinas that sort of keeps you behind the wheel of one. I, I, I think. Well, I think I grew up with them. So my dad obviously had the saloon from 1982. That's been in the family, and we did it up primarily for for him. Yeah. Um, he was about to semi-retire, but unfortunately he got a cancer diagnosis and passed away before we finished it. Oh right. So. It, 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 they have an infinity, uh, affinity, shall I say. And yeah. They just, yeah, I can't let them go. No. Um, we, we're after another one. I now have another one in a garage um, that I've probably got, you know, an option for later down the line, but we'll have to wait and see. But yeah. I'd love to, if, if that doesn't come my way, I'd love to help them do it because they just, yeah, yeah. we just love them. Well, that's great. Yeah. Well, there you have it. So if anyone has one of these and uh, needs a bit of help or advice, Richard Germain. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, man. Thank you. Cheers. You see a lot of old British classics at these kind of shows, uh, certainly a lot of MGBs and that sort of thing. Uh, but, Brian here, you've, uh, you've got something a little bit rare, you were telling me. Yeah, it's a, it's a frog-eyed Sprite, Austin Healy frog-eyed Sprite. OK. Uh, it was manufactured in 1960, and believe it or not, I worked on these for years. 
Because I've been in the motor trade mechanic for 70 years. Blimey. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a long time. I'm now the 85 years old. Uh, and uh, as I say, it's sort of because I always worked on Austin Morris and what have you, I had to have one. They never had one. I drove many. Never could afford one. Right. Then I could afford one. So I bought this. Yeah. Uh, and uh, now I'm looking for an MGA. A bit of advertising there. I'm looking for an MGA. Yeah, so if anyone's got an MGA available, uh, get in touch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you were saying that the thing that really marks yours out against some of the other ones is its originality. It's totally original. It's not been altered in any way. It's got the original 7-inch drum brakes, which makes it very difficult to stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's got the old gearbox. We know Synchron first, but Synchron second, third and fourth. Yep. Uh, and it's got the little 948cc engine. Yeah. It's, it's called the A-type engine. They fitted it now with the Morris Miners, the Minis, the Allegros, all fitted the A, what we call the A-type. Yeah. And the B-type was fitted in the like Austin Cambridge years. Also. Yeah. I worked on for donkey's years. Yeah. <laughs> love, I love the old cars. Yeah. Especially old uh, British cars. And all the years you're working on them, did did you think that you'd actually would get one, or did you think it would? I couldn't afford it. I mean, yes, I, I can't even remember what they were, but they're only about 150 quid or something like that, new. Yeah. But I mean, we're talking 60 years ago, and I think I was earning about 50 pounds a week or something like that, maybe less. I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, no, I couldn't afford that. Uh, and I, I tell you what I did, I ran minis, I had six or seven minis over the years, and, and the uh, Austin 1300, which was another one, which I loved, uh, which I actually owned, you know, but uh, I can never afford it. I did go one bit and bought a, a midget, which was the one after this, the MG midget. Not impressed. Mm. It wasn't the same car. No. And it was a rock box. They rotted. That's the trouble why there's none of our old British cars about mm. because British cars just rotted away. It's interesting the comparison to the midget because obviously these and the midgets were both quite popular for motorsport, the, the, weren't they? This, this is a Mark 1 spray. Mm. Now, the Mark 2 was rebadged. Austin Healy spray. MG Midget, exactly the same car, yeah. just the badge. And you get that a lot even with the later ones, the Minis, the Oxfords. And, yeah. Uh, badge engineering right. certainly not something new, is it? No, the, the problem with British Rail and uh, BMC is it, they never move forward. No. Uh, and they made some really cracking cars in the day. But that was in the day. Now here I seem to have stumbled on a vehicle that I didn't actually know existed. Uh, so yes, it's a BMW E3316i, nothing too unusual there. Uh, but this particular one is a Bauer conversion, a Bauer TC2. Now I was aware of the Bowers on the earlier E213 series, uh, but not on these E30s. I was of the impression that by that point it was all back in house uh, and it was a regular uh, drophead convertible. But uh, yeah, really nice to see this one today. Um, something else in here, it's got the mother of all period accessories as well um, it's got the uh, the good old car phone um, so yeah the perfect accessory for a 1980s BMW I'm always on the lookout for unique and interesting cars at these shows uh, and Tony and Yvonne here have one such car uh, Tony tell us a little bit about what you've got here and why why you took the step to buy a car like this well it's right down in the 1960s before before I even met Yvonne and uh, we were going to a, I think it was Cars of Morley at the time and there were an American car on the forecourt and I went, me and my, me and my friend went down to look at it and go oh, for brilliant, you know, nothing like anything that's over here. You know, the, the sort of modest miners and all the, the, the which, we, which, we, which we ended up with, anyway, one or two of them. But uh, I always wanted one after that, so we messed about and got married and moved out and got the modest miner and went moved out. None of them were, were big enough to take a car, uh, an American car. Okay. Right, so anyway, we moved, we moved into Yvonne's dad's house after it passed away, of course, and um, after we'd settled up and everything, we decided to extend the house, the bungalow. Uh, so we put um, a 
bed a couple of bedrooms on top. We also I said, all right, this is the time to build the big carriage. So we did. And then we looked online and we went through one of the um, auction sites and we saw this orange one. And I thought, oh, Yvonne said, oh, I like that. So we had to wait until he, he bid. Anyway, he did. He bid one up, so I thought, that's it, we finish. <laughs> yeah, and then, then we got in touch with the guy through, through the cl various clubs and friends across the road who also has a American car. And he said, oh, so and so's, uh, so and so will, will look, after, look after you if you want a car. And we went to this guy and he showed us one or two cars and this came up. So we, that's, we bought it and that's more or less it. Yeah, and what is this that you've got to This is a Pontiac Granville. Pontiac Granville? Yeah. yeah. It's a seven and a half litre V8. Um, and it's automatic. Okay. As you can see, it's convertible and that. So uh, it was just more or less what we wanted. Yeah. You know, it's. It's, it's a nice car, it's been looked after. I think there's probably one or two owners before us. The last owner that had it had it for about 22 years. Right. You know, so it has been looked after. You're in, you're in um, what, what they call them, them, a gated community. Oh, right, okay. We, you know, we, we, we guards on big gates, so it was looked after. You know. I imagine it would have probably been quite an expensive car even uh, in America when it was new. When it was new, I think. It, if I look at the thing, it was probably about four and a half thousand. Yeah. When, it, when you were in '74, you know, but it, it, it was getting to the, getting to sort of the last of the big cars, yeah. the last of the big engines, you know, because you, you know the fuel in America was starting to rise. Yeah. You know, so they decided that uh, the drop drop the size drop the size of engine. Mm. You know, because obviously ten miles a gallon. Yeah. In you know on a run. Ice cream, you know, it, 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 it does cost a bit, so we've got to watch where we go. Yeah, you yeah. Know. I think the gap between American and European cars has sort of bridged a little over the decades. Obviously, they still do tend to favour larger cars than what we do, but uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, not to the extent of what what they are with this. No. So, Yvonne, how did you receive uh, this car then? Obviously, it's. Uh, I remember my wife rolling her eyes when I turned up with an older car. So, when it <laughs> <laughs> no, we we met. To go to a Vauxhall Cresta. All oh, right. And it looked so smooth, and that was the nearest thing to an American car, really. Yeah. And when when I knew how, how long it wanted the car, just had to have it when it got nearly, the chance. Nearly, I had it to the last person I interviewed, it was for 50 years. Right. But it's actually <laughs> more 60 years. Yeah. So I've been waiting 60 years, although we've had different cars in between. Yeah. But not, not the one that really wanted. Yeah, and I thought I'd done badly having to wait 25 years for my dream car. <laughs> <laughs> well, six, 60, year, 60, 60 years. Yeah. yeah. But you're enjoying the car and uh, hopefully we'll continue yeah, to... Yeah, when the weather's, when the weather's fine. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a nice car. Mm. Nice and smooth and everything, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's good, plenty of room. Yeah. Yeah, because you're quite a tall chap as well, aren't you? It's, That's it. Uh, yeah. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a bit hard to see on camera being set, sitting down, but I remember when I saw you last time, you were... Uh, yeah, about you, six foot four. Six foot four, yeah, so... Because it does, certainly with older cars, it will limit your uh, choice somewhat. That's it. Yeah, well, with other cars, sometimes you, you get in them and, and you, you know, you're nearly touching, nearly touching the, the, the roof. Yeah. And then when you get in, you've got to, like, double, you double up to get in. And then when you're getting out, if, you, if, it's, if it's a car with a low seat, yeah. And you, you know, you, you sort of knee, knees have gone like so. Yeah. You know, it's a bit of a problem. But this. That's the beauty of a convertible, down, isn't it? When the top's down, you just, you just slide in and out, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's good. Enjoy it. Smashing. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. It's always nice seeing something a bit different at these shows, and uh, today I've uh, really done well because I found something else a bit unusual, uh, perhaps more unusual than most. Uh, John, tell me, what exactly have we got here? It's a 1931 Model A Ford with a 390 Cadillac engine, a TH400 gearbox, Volvo back axle, uh, home-built chassis. Everything's homemade, basically. Yeah. So you mentioned, obviously, you did actually build this y yeah. yourself. So, so how how did it come to be? How did you what what made you decide to do it? Um, I don't know. I just I just like them. <clears throat> I 
I've had it about I did it about ten years ago. This mm. um, you just keep altering as you go along as well. But you like something, you go for it. I suppose it's just how it is. Yeah. Is this the first one you've done? Yeah. Yeah. So I take it you started out with a, the regular Ford, then did you, and went yeah, from just, there? Just, just body shell basically. And yeah. Went from there. Mm. Uh, just see what everybody else has done and sort of get your own ideas and go from there, that's it. Yeah, excellent. That's smashing well. Thank you very much. No problem. I'm rather partial to uh, a few old Italian classics. Um, now, he was the lucky owner of this Fulvia, a Fulvia 3. It's a Fulvia 3, yeah, I'm a lucky owner uh, because the uh, gentleman that I bought it from I'd had it for, I think, 30 years. Right. And he lovingly looked after it all that time. Yeah. Um, and uh, eventually the time came when he had to uh, make the very difficult decision, which was to sell it. Yeah. Um, and uh, so when I came along to uh, to have a look at it, yeah. um, we, we got on together quite well. And I said, well, don't you worry, George. Uh, if I buy your car, I'll look after it just as you have. Yeah. And on that basis, and one or two other little details, which you can't. Yeah. And uh, so I'm still on good terms with him, and I can ring him up and ask him any questions about the car and all that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah. Excellent. Uh, it all happened rather suddenly. Uh, yeah. I was without a classic car, uh, having parted with my Alpha uh, last year. Right. And, uh, which I mean, Alpha did you have? I had a GTV 2000. Oh, very nice. Um, which I've, I've had here uh, at this show a couple of times. Yeah. And uh, I parted company with it in difficult circumstances. And those circumstances eventually got sort of resolved and I found myself able to get back to doing another year of classic motoring. I didn't have a car to do it in. Yeah. And so I uh, just had a look around and uh, obviously I was like fancied uh, lunches and uh, I saw this one and I thought, yep, that might yeah. be for me. And it is. Yeah. So there we go. Yeah, the uh, parting in under unfortunate circumstances is something I had to do last year with, with two modern Fiats. It seems to be the way with Italian cars, I think, but uh, maybe that's what they're talking about when they say about the pain and the passion. Possibly so. <laughs> well, I had my Alpha for 10 years, you know. Yeah. So it was a bit of a wrench when I parted with it, but uh, uh, like when I bought from George, I sold it to uh, a gentleman who uh, I'd come long, quite a long way to see the car, yep. um, and he'd had one before, and he knew about the car, and I sort of thought, yeah, he'll look after it properly. Yeah. Um, and so I was happy to uh, shake hands on the deal at that particular point in time. Yeah. And I'm sure he is looking after it. Excellent. So. But yeah, the, I mean, the Lanche is certainly quite a unique, interesting car. Obviously, we were discussing off camera earlier the uh, there were the Zagato-bodied versions of these cars as well, weren't there? Yeah. Which command a bit of a premium over these. Uh, they, they, they do, yeah. Um, and you could spend an awful lot of money on them if you, uh, uh, because basically they, uh, they they took the bottom end, um, they sliced it around, and then they put this aluminium body on the top. Yeah. Um, and so, um, uh, of course, Zagata was unique in his ideas on styling. And yeah. You can always tell the Zagato car. Yeah. And uh, they say that um, uh, no Zagato car has ever lost money. Once you, once Zagato has done it, and if you keep it in good condition, it'll always make money because yeah. of its uniqueness, you know? Yeah. But, uh, so it'd be nice to have a Zagato, um, but I'm, I'm very happy with this anyway. The so. thing with coach-built cars, I think the money, yeah, no, money no object. Cars. Yeah, money no object. I think a lottery win, I would be having a coach-built car, but I think with the Fulvia, it's the one exception to the rule where I actually the car they started with is so stunning yeah it'd be a hard choice wouldn't it I think it yeah, between yeah, between yeah, the two it's quite a pretty little thing yeah um, I would regard my Alpha as a rather beautiful object um, it's a work of automotive art mm. uh, I wouldn't say this is this is just pretty yeah I'd describe it differently yeah um, of course the thing with the um, the, the thing with the Lanchers the beauty was never just skin deep, was it? Because so oh, no. there was a first with things like disc brakes, weren't they? And obviously they, they had many first to launch it. Yeah, um, uh, I think they put the, first, put the first V6 engine in a car, in a production car, um, uh, the first um, uh, sort of monocoque bodied car. Uh, a lot, a lot of firsts. Yeah, did launch uh, and mainly there was about the engineering and quality, uh, and that was the downfall eventually because um, 
they didn't really be, didn't get bothered too much by the beam counters, but eventually the beam counters said, "I'm sorry, this is <laughs> no yeah. more," and uh, they had to it, eventually. It get happened in with them all, didn't it? Though Fiat uh, bought them out, and yeah. well, they saved the company, so you would say that was a good thing. Yeah. Um, but this is the last of the the, the, the true lunches, really. Yeah. Um, but uh, obviously afterwards, uh, Fiat gave them uh, one of the best ever uh, engines to put in a car, yeah. uh, which is the um, the Lombrady, uh overhead camshaft engine. Yeah. And that, that that engine went on to to power, you know, uh, rally winning cars. You know, like the uh, Delta Integrale is basically underneath yeah. is that original Fiat twin cam engine. Yeah. This car didn't do, do too badly in the engine department itself, though, did uh, it? No, With, it didn't. Uh, I mean, then this car started off uh, 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 Lancia in, in the rally business. Before that, they weren't really in rally business. And uh, they, they gave it a go with this car, I'll be the 1600 version of it. Yeah. Uh, and did pretty well. And they thought, oh, well, this is quite good. Um, and so they just sort of uh, hung on in there. Uh, and all of their cars were, were, were uh, championship winning cars. Yeah. Because of the quality of the engineering and the design went into it. Well, under the bonnet of this one, we've got a rather unique uh, design of engine because we've got a, a very narrow angle V4 we have indeed, yes. canted over under the bonnet there, haven't we? The bonnet and sitting out in front of the front axle. Yeah. Um, so, so effectively it's a V, but it's one cylinder head, isn't it? One cylinder head, yeah, you, you know your cars then. Yeah, it's one cylinder head, very narrow V. Uh, so, yeah, it's a unique thing, really. Uh, that, that itself is a lot of engineering beauty. Yeah. Say, that little engine. Yeah, how do they, how do they rev? Are they quite, do they thrive well, on revs? Very revy, yes, you yeah. need to use the revs. A word of the sort of red liner? Uh, well, the, the red lines, uh, well, sort of six and a half to eight, really. Right. Uh, I don't take it up to that. But, no. Um, but but for an to, engine of that era, that's you, quite... You do need to rev it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not got a lot of torque. You know? No. <laughs> no. So but you, that's always a trade-off, but I think cars of a bygone era were often built that way anyway, weren't they? they were, yes. Yeah. Well, as, as someone once said to me, or uh, who knew about his car, he said, uh, 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 when I told him that it was harder work to drive than the Alpha, which had a lot more torque yeah. and more power, he said, well, you have to drive it like an Italian car. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just keep your foot in the floor all the time, you know, yeah. and it will reward you, yeah. which it does. <laughs> yeah, they certainly do. Right, well, that's smashing. Thank you very much. Okay. I've, I've really enjoyed having a look at this one. Very good. Thank you. We barely scratched the surface with Walton Car Show attracting over 200 cars every year. In part, you will be shining a spotlight on some V8 British muscle with the Triumph Stag. A very rare version of the car that you always promised yourself. Triumph running gear with a gorgeous coupe glass fibre body with the Bonda Keep. And we'll be going out in style with the Sunbeam Rapier. I'll catch you in part two.